Hello, I'm Sophie Till. This is a series of presentations about the Taubman-Gilansky approach to strings. The presentations form a comprehensive series, but have also been designed to work alone so they can be used in various ways. They address some of the fundamental principles of the approach and show how these principles can provide answers to some of the most commonly asked questions by players of all levels, from professionals to students. The information presented makes most sense when we feel it ourselves, combining knowledge and sensation. There is an immediately recognizable, clear, physical logic to it. While these presentations are not a substitute for hands-on work, they can offer an entry point to this wonderful information. The interdependence of the two arms. When we're playing, there are many different activities going on at the same time, so we need to have a coordinating principle that enables us to put them all together with fluidity and ease, so the different activities in the two arms can function together. We can't compute so many different activities if there is not a clear relationship between them all and something that unites them. So this brings us to the fundamental Taubman principle of the interdependence of the two arms. What do we mean by interdependence and what exactly is the difference between interdependent and independent? A simple analogy for interdependence is how we use a knife and fork. Each exists on its own and is its own tool, but when we use them together to eat, they relate to each other and need each other in order to function. It is rather hard to eat without the knife and fork having a relationship to each other. By contrast, when things are independent, they simply exist on their own and function alone even if they happen to be in close proximity to one another. In playing, we need all the different activities to work in a coordinated and interdependent way, which requires a un unifying coordinating principle. Most of the time when we're playing, we're dealing with the larger movements in the bow arm as it goes back and forth in relation to the smaller movements in the left hand as it plays the notes. When we have activities of different sizes, it is for the most part the smaller activity that commands the larger one and we coordinate from the smaller movement to the larger. What this means is that even though we feel the bow and left hand happening at the same time, the left hand is, the, is in the driving seat. It's not that they happen one after the other, but one needs to be in command. In the presentation on tone production, we looked at how, when we apply our understanding of walking hand and arm to martelet, all the bow's activities function from vertical moment to vertical moment, and not from the horizontal, and how the horizontal movement of the bow moving along the string is a result of those vertical moments. Likewise with the left hand, when the finger goes down through the string to the point of sound, that is its vertical moment. Just as when you take a step, you put your foot down, and that step is what propels you along to the next step. Without that moment of verticality, you cannot move along. So we can see that the engine in both arms comes from their vertical moments, and it is the coordination of the two moments of verticality in both left and right arm that enables us to combine the different activities. We can only coordinate from verticality to verticality, not from the horizontal or a combination of vertical and horizontal. Very often we try and coordinate a vertical left arm to a horizontal right arm, but that isn't possible either. The two points of verticality are the arm and finger reaching the point of sound on the left and the martelet moment or the initiating nudge for the bow on the right. So with my left arm, it's this moment, and with my right arm, it's this point of contact here. So the playing finger's arrival at the point of sound meets the bow's arrival on its precise vertical spot on the string, and our thinking is organized from these moments. Of course we listen to what happens thereafter, but the thinking is working from vertical to vertical. It's the same when we walk, dance, or play sports. The moment of verticality or contact is what creates the movement. If you ask most people to close their eyes and think about playing the violin, cello, or viola, they'll often say they feel the left hand as vertical notes in precise places, but they feel the bow as horizontal and a whole big piece, a sea of white hair. If we're going to be coordinated, those specific left hand spots have to relate to equally specific spots on the bow. In other words, the hair on the bow has to have the same specificity and precision as the left hand on the fingerboard. 
it is almost as if the left hand is playing directly onto the bow, demanding the same precision from the hair. So if we're going to do this, we need to start to build up the sensitivity as to how the left hand fingers travel through the string. We often spend hours and years trying to get clarity by thumping the fingers into the string. If it's not clear, we thump more. But think about your legs and feet for a minute. If you slam your foot into the floor, what you get is a jolt or a kickback through all the joints. If you tried to run like that, it would look pretty funny and would certainly not be winning any races or feeling very good. So we need to be very clear where the point of sound is and therefore what exactly the left hand is trying to do in that initial playing moment. Understanding the point of sound for the left hand was also discussed in the presentation on four equal fingers. All we're actually trying to do is connect the string to the fingerboard enough to change the pitch. The finger is sitting on top of the string and the string is connecting to the fingerboard just enough in relationship to the fingerboard to produce pitch. Of course, some finger comes around the sides, but the point of sound is where the string connects just enough to change its length. We often play the finger to the wood and not the string to the wood. You can feel this easily if you just pick up your violin and feel the strings with your right hand because the right side doesn't have the same baggage as the left. So this raises another important part of the picture. The body computes how much to do any task through touch. We know how much to hold a cup without squeezing because the skin sends information to the arm as to how much holding is necessary. Equally, we know if we're slamming our feet into the floor through touching the ground, even though we're wearing shoes and socks, we can still feel those connections. The skin and touch are crucial to our capacity to know how much feels right. We've all had the experience of trying to hold something with freezing cold hands. It's hard because we can't feel, so the information as to how much to, to do it can't get to the arm. On the violin, when we overplay the strings, we desensitize the fingertips, and it's, so it's difficult to feel and sense how much is enough. If we want to resensitize the fingers and enable them to recognize the point of sound, then they need to be able to play with ease within their comfortable finger capacity. This means that they can't do the task alone, but need that basic finger hand and forearm alignment that enables the forearm to lend its support. When the arm is lined up, we can work from the border of doing too little rather than always trying to do more. If there isn't enough connection with the string, the worst that will happen is the string will squeak. So we need to feel what it's like just the other side of that border, where pitch is just pitch and nothing more. It's simple to feel our instinctive use of this basic alignment to do this type of task if you just put your hand up to your cheek. You can stay there for a minute and you can feel the easy, grippy quality of the fingers and how the forearm enables the hand to stay there without squeezing or falling off. So playing with the left hand is exactly the same. You can play around with this by sending your arm up to a note in one motion and just sounding exactly what you get. This also helps us realize that when we're playing and coming from high above the strings, it's going to make it harder, not easier. Being six inches above the string doesn't change where the point of sound is, it just makes it further away and therefore slower to get there, and we tend to arrive in a flustered heap. This raises an interesting thought for practice and reflection of a cultural issue. We tend to think that if something is good, we need more of it. So we practice doing more and more. But if it's good, I need to know exactly where that good is and that's it. I need to recognize that sweet spot and just be there. Pitch is pitch, there's no more pitch beyond the point of sound. There's just more work, tied arms, hands, fingers, calluses, etc. So when we start working this way, most people don't believe they can do so little because we're used to doing so much. 
But when the basic alignment allows the fingers to access that forearm support so they don't need to press, the sound pops out loud and clear with the string freely able to vibrate. When we're in the higher registers, the point of sound is even more surprising. We don't even need to get the string to the wood because there's so much tension in the string itself. High up, there's actually daylight under the finger. So the left hand's world is from the top of the string to the point of sound, which means that while we cannot play beyond that or produce dynamics from here, we can, to a certain extent, time the string by the speed with which we reach the point of sound. I'm actually using a tiny rotational movement that sends me or propels me from note to note and is the mechanism whereby the finger reaches the point of sound. Rotation is essential to the Taubman work, but it isn't a suitable topic for this kind of presentation in this context. So setting rotation aside, if we start to be aware of the pads of the fingers being sensitive to the string, we can feel that the fingers can play relatively slowly to the point of sound and that we can time the string. This is crucial if the left hand is going to be the cueing mechanism for both arms. So if you take a simple example, you can start to feel the left hand pads cueing the bow's vertical moments. When the left arm starts to become the cueing mechanism, it also starts to organize all the other activities that need to happen. It becomes the organizing principle. So not only does it cue the bow's vertical moment, the martelé moments, but we know from the bow principles we looked at that the bow arm muscles have to subside at the bow change in order to go the other way, from up to down or down to up. Subsiding means that the muscles have to be in neutral so they can be free to go the other way. This is something we do all the time at lightning speed. If we didn't, we'd have dual muscular pull as the muscles try and go in two directions at once. So when the left hand's vertical moment becomes the cueing mechanism, it starts to organize this subsiding. The subsiding knows when to happen. We don't have to think about it. The left hand tells it when to happen. So if I take a simple scale and play one note per bow, I can start to feel the left hand pads cueing the bow's martelé moments and the subsiding necessary in the bow changes. If you look at the strings where the bow plays, and you put a combination of left hand fingers down. So if you look here and play fingers here, you can see that the string moves up here every single time you put down a different finger. This means that every time the finger descends to the point of sound, the string is actually moving under the hair. So I need my right forearm to acknowledge each one of these moments. They are mini verticals, tiny points where we need to reconnect left and right arm together, otherwise the bow will actually just plow through the notes, or we get what I call the lawnmower technique, with the bow obliterating the notes. If I have four sixteenth notes to play in a slur, it is not the case that my bow is actually playing a quarter note while my left hand plays the sixteenth. If I treat it that way, I'll be mowing through those tiny vertical moments where the left hand changes the string length. On the other hand, if I acknowledge them just enough in the right arm, the sound will ring out on each. So here are four notes acknowledged by the bow. And here they are without that acknowledgement, with the right arm playing a quarter note and the left the sixteenth. And with the acknowledgement, these tiny essential moments of coordination are what I call mini martelé moments. It doesn't mean portato at all, unless that's the effect you want. 
It simply means coordinating the points of verticality, however tiny they are. So when we start to understand this, it opens up all kinds of possibilities. It means we can inject specific amounts of sound into these vertical moments and control the contour of the music much more precisely. A slur really is a series of tiny vertical moments that happen in one bow direction. So let's take a little example from Beethoven. He often asks us to add complex combinations or dynamics and articulations within one gesture. He often puts an accent on a note in the middle of a passage or on a surprising part of the meter, uses forte pianos, etc. If I understand this relationship of left to right arm, I can easily inject these different flavors into the precise moment. So here what I'm doing, I'm showing the Rin Forzando here and changing the color here. I'm also changing the color on the little ornament. And after the ornament, I'm re-engaging. If I want something to sound very legato but really express the line of the slur, I can do that too. cases, if I don't understand this principle, all I can do is generically hope that my bow stroke will affect the overall phrase. I cannot control it specifically from note to note. So a slur isn't really a slur. It's a series of mini martelet vertical moments that sound connected but are grouped as a series in the same bow direction. Both these examples contain another stumbling block for the interdependence of the two arms, and that is the constant need to shift, or in the Talmud language, what we say is to leap. The reality of a leap is that even if we're taking a miniature leap, even just the move of a half step, the left arm has to be at least one shade away from the point of sound in order to move or it's going to be stuck down. So if I'm going to be able to move, there has to be a moment when I let go of the old note in order to move to the new note. By definition, my feet leave the floor to a degree if I'm going to leap, even if it is tiny. We spend a lot of time pretending that shifts aren't there, like the little kid who thinks he can't be seen just because he covers his eyes. We often try and use a lot of bow, almost as if it will inspire the left arm to move, or Sometimes we only half play the note before the shift, making it very light, as if to enable the shift to happen faster. If I mow through the leap or I pretend it isn't there, the audience will usually hear it. It might be too loud, too much slide, or just a hole in the phrase. But if, on the other hand, we acknowledge the reality of the leaps with the right physical tools, we can coordinate them and control the sound around them so they are genuinely blended within the line. The bow has got to know exactly when the leap is going to happen. If it doesn't, it will just keep going. The brain and the body are so smart, they know that the left hand isn't ready and doesn't have time to make the leap, and the hands will panic, which is actually a reasonable response because there really hasn't been time to make the leap. On the other hand, when we coordinate the points of verticality, the left arm can tell the bow when to wait. Not an abrupt stop, but a coordinated wait or pause within the momentum of the phrase that gives the left hand its minute technical window of time in which to move. Because each moment is getting an injection of tone, it's easy to adjust the speed of the bow arm in response to the leap. While leaping is a presentation in itself and requires left arm rotation, there are some fundamental elements that can help in the basic coordination of the two arms. The first question is why calling it a leap rather than shifting and what elements are involved with that. 
So if we think about how we leap or jump with our legs, we realize that we need three things to be successful. We need to know exactly how to leap, where we're going, and precisely when to leap. If you want to jump over anything, the first thing you have to do is go down more profoundly into the ground in a preparatory movement. That provides us with the propulsion to make the leap work. If you couldn't see what you were aiming at, you'd have no idea how to calculate this preparatory movement, as you would be leaping blind. Equally problematic, if someone comes and talks to you just as you make that preparatory movement and you stay down in that mode, the movement loses its propulsive quality and renders the leap useless. The same would be true if you made no preparatory movement at all. The leap simply won't make it. We can't jump from nothing. So these principles apply to the finger, hand, and arm also. So the most important note of a leap is actually the leaping off note that sends the arm over to the new note. Very often, when we look at how we write shifts into the music, we're only looking at the arriving note. We aren't seeing it as a two-note activity of leaping off note and arriving note. But if we know which note is going to make the leap happen, that can cue the bow to adjust its speed and then replay on the new note. So a basic, look, basic leap looks like this. If I take three notes and leap off the third and arrive in the new place, you'll see this. Leap. I had a vertical moment on the first two, and I can then feel the left hand making the C sharp, the leaping off note, cueing the adjustment in the bow, and they reunite on the F sharp. An easy way to help us do this is to take a fresh look at the music and process each shift, not as one note in a new position, but as a two note activity the leaping off note sending us to the new note with the bow coordinated from those two vertical moments. It is important to emphasize that a leap like this doesn't mean I'm leaving the string completely. I'm leaving the point of sound enough to move freely to the new place. So I am usually somewhere within that springiness of the string. It's easy to feel when it's not enough because it's a drag, and if it's too much, I become disconnected from the instrument and feel lost en route. So this brings us to what I call the staccato spectrum. Sometimes we can truly play legato, but in reality, with four strings and four fingers, I need to move a great deal, even if it is tiny amounts. So actually, much of the time, we're playing somewhere on the staccato spectrum with both hands. It doesn't mean the whole phrase is not legato. It just means I have to acknowledge the reality of the leap when it happens, and then I can use the coordination of the two hands plus bow shaping and in and out to color and shape the phrases in a way that the musical logic is not disturbed, but I have time to make the leap. In this example from the Strauss Sonata, the phrase is very legato, but there are many leaps, tiny ones, ones crossing strings and large ones. Each one will be coordinated with enough staccato element that I can leap, however small, to that next place telling the bow when those leaps are happening so that the two arms can reconnect on the new vertical moment. So here's that Strauss example again. mean if the note is a long one? Once we start using this concept of leap plus interdependence, we realize that in long sustained passages, we not only have to know exactly where the leaps are and which notes are the leaping off notes, but we actually need to decide precisely when we're going to leap off the long note. We can't confuse sustaining a note and leaping off it. In the presentation on vibrato, we looked at the left hand's playing mechanism versus its sustaining mechanism, and the tiny adjustment of the down when the pitch sounds compared to it standing in one place while the note is sustained. When we have these long notes, we just need to decide exactly which moment at the end of the note the left arm will make its preparatory motion for the leap, 
Otherwise, we have no propulsion and we find ourselves dragging the arm along the string. It's almost like there's a sub-rhythm behind the rhythm of the long note itself. So in this tiny excerpt from the Dvorak Quintet, we have to decide where at the end of the whole note to make the leap. I'll show the leap by clicking my tongue when that leaping moment is going to happen. Here it is again. Without the click. I've noticed in teaching that when this issue comes up, it's very helpful to put that little click in because it gives the arm a precise moment in which to move and stimulates the momentum to do so, in particular in these long sustained passages. So understanding the leaps on long notes this way stops them from getting stuck and buys my left arm a window in which to move, what I sometimes call creating a technical window within which the left arm has time to execute what it needs to move into the next place. So if the left arm is responsible for cueing the right, then this has implications for repeated notes. In general, we tend to leave the left hand down and use the bow to articulate, but actually that means the left hand is dead and there's no rhythm and nothing activating the string. That cueing mechanism isn't functioning and becomes very tiring. So a repeated note needs some kind of minuscule restriking from the left hand, and we're taking minuscule to a new level of smallness here. It needs just enough to ignite the string again. This is often referred to as rebounding the finger, or letting the string throw the finger, hand, and arm back up just enough that they can replay. We have to remember that the string has tension in it, so is capable of sending the finger back up again, as does a trampoline. It does not need to send the finger off the string, but just barely enough to re-articulate so the bow has a cue and the left arm's not stuck down. So this is crucial in repetitive passages. Often we find these in the second violin, viola parts. A good and easy way to feel just how small this is is to do it on your cheek. You can actually feel the surface of the cheek sending the arm and finger back up. It doesn't feel like you're hopping up and down on your cheek. It just feels like the skin on your cheek is bouncing the finger for you. Notice also that if you try and do it exactly on the same spot, the arm freezes up. The muscles cannot repeat exactly in the same place with ease. What you're doing is instinctively and minutely adjusting where you are on the tip of the finger and letting the cheek rebound the finger. This is exactly what happens on the string. The string is springy and has tension in it. It rebounds the finger, which cues the bow when to replay the repeated note. So if I take a string of repeated sixteenths in 4-4 time, I can use this rebounding to help the bow and maintain that interdependence and avoid fatigue. So let's choose some straight repeated sixteenths. <laughs> If I take that cueing mechan mechanism out, it sounds like this. As soon as I put it back in, as soon as I put it back in, not only does it feel better, but it provides the shape and the momentum and order to all those repeated notes. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule. There are always exceptions, or rather examples where the cueing mechanism is not quite so straightforward as simply left arm cueing right. But what we can understand is the interdependent relationship between left and right and the fundamental idea of the smaller movement in the left hand commanding the bow's martelet moments. So both arms are coordinated from verticality to verticality. Once we have this principle in place, it enables us to explore the interdependence of the hands in the repertoire. We know that when the arms feel confused, it is an interdependence issue, and that enables us to pick up the right toolbox to solve the problem. <laughs>